right. So this is the John Hauberg Museum, Indian Museum. There's the European John Hauberg. Now, when you come in, this is the Sauk and Meskwaki migration. The Meskwaki Indian origin, the Sauk Indian origin. Now, if you see, that is up in Canada. So then it shows their route in which they came. Lake Erie. Sock came up, came down around Lake Michigan, come down here. Now we are about right in here somewhere. This is where we are. So this was all his land. Migration, the oral tradition. The Sock and Meskwaki, or the Fox Indians, originated in Canada. The Sauk near present-day Montreal, the Meskwaki near Lake St. John. Both tribes were living in Canada 12,000 years ago at the time of the last glacial retreat. According to Meskwaki oral tradition, many centuries later they and the Sauk were displaced from their Canadian home by the Iroquois a southern people who moved up the Mississippi and Ohio River valleys into Lower Canada. By 1640, the Sauk and Meskwaki had settled in present-day Michigan. The Sauk near Saginaw Bay and Meskwaki near present-day Detroit. Their written history began with the arrival of the French explorers and missionaries in the 1640s. Then we have the migration written history. The history of the Sauk and Meskwaki in the Midwest was marked by shifting alliances and tensions with their enemies, both Indian and French. For two decades in the mid-1600s, the Sauk and Meskwaki fought the Iroquois and their allies before withdrawing to Wisconsin. In 1701, a decades-long war between the French and Meskwaki began, which led to the, la to the latter's near extermination. In 1735, the weakened Meskwaki joined the Sauk, and they migrated together to the Mississippi River. For nearly 100 years until the Black Hawk War of 1832, the tribes lived in their own villages and cities and sustained themselves with farming, hunting, and trading. I'm going to try and get a bigger picture of this map. And then there's just some displays. Here's more. Sinisippi. The Sauk and Meskwaki are... Algonquin, Algonquin people and are linguistically and culturally related. Intermarriage between the two tribes was not uncommon. Throughout their many migrations, the two tribes lived near each other. During their time in the Rock Island area, which is where we live, the Rock River called Sinisippi in their language served as the dividing line between them. The Sauk lived south of the river and the Meskwaki lived north. The Meskwaki were the smaller of the two tribes with a population of about 1,600. They lived in several small villages located at 40 mile intervals from Wapello's village in the south to a village near the mouth of the Turkey River nearly 250 miles away. The Meskwaki established a village near the Dubuque lead mines where lead mining was an important industry for them. Sauconog. The Sauk lived in one large city, Sauconog. It contained over 100 longhouses with a population of about 5,000. 
It was one of the largest native settlements on the continent and was laid out as, as any modern city might be with straight streets and intersecting alleys. How, houses faced onto the streets. The city was divided into neighborhoods with one clan a, 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 occupying each side of the city leading to a great public square located in f in front of the council house the council house served as the seat of government periodically for the populate the population would gather in the public square for in important ceremonies that served as the glue that held their society together and then here's more photos and then when we come in here there's the sock and knock and they have a display let's see if I can keep the light out of it nope I'm not being able to but this is kinda how their huts were set up and everything and then the Sauk and Meskwaki removal. So this is going to be when they're on the retreat. You can always pause and look at something if you want to zoom in on it. Here's the card. In 1804, five Sauk and Meskwaki men signed a treaty with the United States seeding over 50 million acres of seeding over 50 million acres of land to the federal government the treaty of 1804 was clearly fraudulent and it troubled relations between the two tribes and the americans for the next 28 years other great lake area tribes disliked the americans too during the war of 1812 Thousands of Indians, including many Sauk and Meskwaki, supported the British. Through the, though the Indians won many battles, in 1814 the British sued for peace, abandoning their Indian allies to their fate. Once the Americans had control of all the land east of the Mississippi, they forced tribes to sign treaties ceding their lands. The treaties allowed the tribes to remain on the land, but there were soon tensions with newly arrived white settlers. Whites from the east flocked into the region, ignoring boundary lines and settling illegally on public lands. Attempts to force the Indians west across the Mississippi were met with resistance with many refusing to leave the land of their grandfathers. The end. In the winter of 1828, a few white families moved into Sockinock while the Sock were away on the winter hunt. Upon their return in the spring, they were astounded to find white families living in their houses and plowing up their cornfields. The Sauk and Meskwaki were told the land was soon to be sold and they must make new homes west of the Mississippi. Most of them reluctantly agreed, however, a large faction of Sauk, led by the warrior Black Hawk, Black Hawk refused to go. They, steadfast, they steadfastly maintained the land had never been sold. They were determined not to relinquish the land that was sacred to them. Tensions mounted over the next two years, and finally, in the summer of 1831, the Illinois militia and federal troops were sent to physically remove Black Hawk and his band. Faced with overwhelming numbers of armed Americans, Black Hawk had no choice but to leave his home. So as you can see, they pushed them out 1832 and beyond in April 1832 Black Hawk and his band returned to Illinois with the intention of living with the Winnebago at Prophetstown 
This move triggered panic on the Illinois frontier, leading to the conflict that is known as the Black Hawk War. It was the last armed conflict between the Indians and the Americans east of the Mississippi. The defeat of Black Hawk's band was staggering blow was a staggering blow to the Sauk Nation. Over a thousand Indians lost their lives, many of them women, children, and the elderly. The treaty that the treaty that ended with con ended the conflict forced the Sauk and Meskwaki to cede land on the west side of the Mississippi. This session included the valuable lead mines at Dubuque. In 1842, the two tribes were removed from Iowa to a reservation in Kansas. In the 1870s, the Sauk were removed to Oklahoma, where they reside today. The Meskwaki still reside in Iowa on a settlement at Tama, Iowa. And then, this is a pretty cool little museum. They got some artifacts and stuff. You can pause this at any time. Here's, here's a picture of Chief Blackhawk. And that statue's outside. We'll get to that in a second. Okay. Amazing painting, by the way. And now... The Sauk and Meskwaki summer. The Sauk and Meskwaki were farmers. They grew over 800 acres of corn, beans, squash, and pumpkin, enough to feed their people for a whole year. The corn and beans were grown together in mounds. The women farmed, get, farmed, gathered plants from the forest, wove mats, and made the clothing. The men hunted, made the canoes, and served as warriors to protect their people. Once again, this painting is pretty amazing. And then, Black Hawk. Black Hawk was born in Sakonok Village in 1767, question mark. He was a young boy when the Americans burnt it to the ground in 1780. He became the leader of those Sauk and Fox who did not want to leave their homeland. Black Hawk was a Sauk, but the two tribes had been allies for many years. The head... The head is made from an original plaster cast made from life, made from life. It shows Black Hawk as he probably looked around 1830, the approximate date of our sock and fox diorama. The metal pipe tomahawk and the two catalonite pipes originally belonged to Black Hawk. There's the axe thing. And here's, let's see, there's, there's Chief Blackhawk. Look at that face. There's his stick. Here's some, some other stuff. This is needed belt right there. A wooden bowl carved from a tree burl. Here's a wooden spoon that belonged to Black Hawk's son. Pretty cool. This must be an apron that he wore or something. Oh, it's a bag. Bandoiler bag. Now they have some model houses here which are pretty cool. Um, this one is called a summer longhouse.
The Sauk and Meskwaki lived in long houses in the summer. They were sided with elm bark. Most houses measured 60 feet long by 30 feet wide. Several related families with as many as 50 people shared each house. Benches were built down the long sides and covered with reed mats and animal skins for comfort. People sat on the benches during the day and slept on them at night. Personal items were stored above and below the benches. Now, this is... They had their fire in the middle. And as you can see, they had a hole up the center of it. But these were how their beds were and everything like that. Pretty neat. And this shows their, their storage rack up above. Here's an, another bed. Down below they've got some... Uh, looks like a little water can or something. Okay. Let's see if I can't get a better picture of this house. So that's, that's kind of what it looked like on the outside. Obviously they were much bigger than that. Um. Here's, look at the bear claws. It's a bear claw necklace, otter fur with trade beads. There's the beads in between the claws there. Pretty neat little ornament. Small twined bag or pouch. Necklaces and beads, more stuff that they did. Twined basewood fiber storage bag. Little scarf. This is a dugout canoe. And this is In 1934, the children in the pictures and their uncle, Urban Johnson, found this canoe stuck in the bottom of the Mississippi River, just below the mouth of the Rock River. The canoe was a rare find since few original dugout canoes still exist. Since the children's grandfather, Henry Johnson, was the ranger at Black Hawk State Park, the canoe was donated to this museum. Here's a little bit better picture of it. Sides are, I'm not allowed to touch. Please do not touch. Dugout canoe. For the Sauk and Meskwaki, dugout canoes were their most important mode of transportation. The canoes were often made of base wood, of base wood or pine. The canoe was shaped by slowly burning the interior of a trunk and digging out the charred wood with stone or metal adzes. It took about two months to make a canoe. This small canoe could hold three people with all their gear. People knelt in the canoes. Men propelled them by the use of poles and paddles. Now, like I said, they, they do have some cool paintings. Really cool paintings here. Um, now we're into the fall. Fall. The women harvested the crops beginning in late August. They dried them to prevent spoilage. The dried vegetables were combined with meat and made into soups and stews. When the harvest was done, the people prepared to leave their towns for the winter hunt. They took some of the dried food with them. The remaining food and 
the seeds needed for planting next spring were left behind stored in underground watertight catch pits. Here's this right here is called a roach. It's a man's headdress made from dyed deer hair. Here's a ball headed war club. Wooden spoon or ladle. I mean, some of this stuff, I'm, I'm not going to spend a whole bunch of time. Here's, here's an instrument. There's a flute of some sort. Lacrosse stick. So they played lacrosse to kill time. Here's a bow and arrow. Pretty neat. Now we're into the winter. Once again, the paintings are amazing. Winter Hunt. The Sauk and Meskwaki moved away from their towns in the early fall and were gone all winter. The tribes divided into small bands and spread out over a wide area to conserve food and fuel resources. Each, hunt, each, hand, each band lived together in the winter camp made up of 30 or more winter houses. The men spent the winter hunting animals whose pelts were traded for goods. The women skinned the animals and dried the meat. So it was the woman's job to clean the animal. Here's another one of their Indians here. Now this is a winter house. More of a rounded shape. Here's inside of it. As you can see, they still had their fire in there. Trying to get a good picture. There's kind of glass in my way. I don't know what it's seeing right now. I can't see the camera. They got rugs down. Now this is called a wick up. Rutting moon to cold moon. The winter house. The Sauk and Meskwaki lived in wickiups during the winter. One family lived in each house. The round house was covered with many layers of cattail mats. The fire in the center of the house kept it warm even on the coldest winter day. A buffalo skin covered the doorway. During the long winter nights, children listened to stories told by their elders. The stories taught the children many traditions and were a source of entertainment. Here's kind of how they fabricated them. I'm sure these were a lot bigger than this as well. Now this is late winter, early spring. Once again, they do have some incredible paintings. Here's an Indian guy cleaning, cleaning some clamshells. Hey, buddy. Oh, that would be something that they would probably stir up food or something in. I'm not really sure. Late winter, early spring. In late February, the women, children, and elderly moved from the winter camps to their sugar maple groves. Sap from the trees was boiled down to make sugar. Sometimes the hot liquid was made into candy, a special treat for the children. The maple sugar was used all year to flavor meats and vegetables. 
When sugaring season was over, the people moved back to the summer towns and the cycle of the season started again. Here's a little boy carrying some some sticks. What's that, buddy? Now we're gonna go outside and check out a statue. So, I'm hoping you're enjoying this. All right, so now here is a statue of Chief Blackhawk. Just bear with me here. There's a statue. I don't know how well you can see this. Blackhawk. Then, Blackhawk, Sock Warrior, 1767 to 1838. Blackhawk, famous Sock Warrior, was born in 1767 at the Sock Town of Sockanock on the Rock River, located about one mile west of this spot. Blackhawk was not a chief. He was a warrior and a leader, and that's a little better. He was a warrior and leader of a political faction within the Sauk Nation. Black Hawk was, de was 13 years old when, Americans f when American forces destroyed Sockanock during the American Revolutionary War. Throughout his adult life, he militarily opposed American expansion into Sauk territory. During the War of 1812, Black Hawk and other Sauk warriors fought on the known fought on the side of the British and against the Americans, known as the British Band. These warriors twice defeated American forces in this area. At the Battle of Campbell's Island, which ain't that far from right where I'm standing, in July 1814, and at the Battle of Credit Island in September 1814, which is about five miles from here. The British ultimately were defeated, yet Black Hawk maintained his political allegiance to them for nearly the rest of his life. In 1829, the American government demanded that the Sauk abandon the town of Sauk and move to the west side of the Mississippi River. Black Hawk was the leader of the large group of Sauk who refused to move. In 1831, they were driven out of Sauk by American troops. Black Hawk and his followers returned to Illinois in April 1832, which resulted in the conflict known as the Black Hawk War. Black Hawk died at the age of 71 on October 3rd, 1838, of respiratory illness. Now, I've got books that say that this war lasted for eight years, Chief Black Hawk was fighting. Illinois and the American Revolution. The Sauk Indian village on the Rock River marks the site of the westernmost conflict of the Revolutionary War. In the summer of 1780, an American force under John Montgomery with French and Spanish allies destroyed the village of Sauconoc. Colonial George Rogers Clark had ordered the expedition in retaliation for Indian participation in the British attempt to capture Cahokia and St. Louis. The Sauk rebuilt their village and remained there until 1828 when most of them moved across the Mississippi. Some families led by the warrior Black Hawk made their home there until after the Black Hawk War of 1832. This is erected by the Illinois Bicentennial Commission and the Illinois State Historical Society, 1976. So, I hope this was a pretty good little tour. And as you can see, they have Cory. These white men done put a Cory 
over here taking God's natural resources right up out the ground you, you got trails I mean this is a very wonderful park there's been a lot of arrowheads and stuff found in this area and as you can see the history of this area is really good beautiful scenery so I hope this kind of enlightened some people on Chief Blackhawk. Thanks.